So hello, um, thank you for coming. My name is Khadija and I, I identify as a textile and digital artist as well as an educator. Um, in my education practice, I connect with people, I connect people to each other. So um, I've been trying to kind of connect my education practice with my art practice. And um, this year, this is my final year of MFA. So I created this web of words to help me understand my own practice. Um, I've been thinking a lot about experiences, how experiences, uh, our lived experiences and knowledge shape our um, our life and our art um, in ways that we know or do not know. And um, some key words or key concepts that I've been finding myself um, often kind of pondering on and making art about over the last decade um, are play, experimentation, labor, engage, unexpected, collaboration, and patterns. Um, yeah, and it's really important for me to kind of uh, come up with these keywords to kind of like remind myself um, where I'm coming from in terms of my art practice and where I might want to go to. And on the note of keyword, sorry, on the note of like connections and like webs of words, I wanted to share with you some collaborative uh, projects that I worked on, some collaborative digital multidisciplinary projects. So this is a collaboration between artist and audience. Uh, this project is called Paper Cut Pattern and Play. It is an interactive installation that invites audiences to engage with and become part of the art. A five minute animation um, plays on a loop on the wall. And it was the animation itself was created using scanned um, hand cut repeat patterns on construction paper. And the animation, so the, pa the patterns on paper were in constant motion, moving around and in on themselves to suggest new possibilities of shapes and patterns and images. Um, and then in the front, there's a plinth with uh, disassembled cubes, acrylic cubes that kind of resemble playing blocks. So these cubes are lined with intricate repeat patterns on red, green, and blue acetates, borrowing from the digital RGB color model that uh, produces infinite colors on the digital screen, but not in real life. So each color here um, holds patterns designed by hand or so the red, for example, are patterns that are designed by hand. So they're hand cut on construction, construction paper and then transferred onto acetate. The green patterns um, represent the red patterns distorted on Photoshop by myself. So I had more control over manually distorting the patterns above. And then the blue patterns are patterns distorted using a photo scanner. So here's where um, I also consider coll collaboration between artist and tool or artist and machine, because I'm using a flatbed scanner in a way that I won't know its outcome. So the so I'm so I'm using a flatbed scanner and when the light of the scanner moves along the bed, I'm dragging my own art um, down with it, like down with the light. And that's how there's a lot of elongated shapes. Um, and I consider that collaboration between the scanner because it's really up to the mater my material choice and the relationship of my material with the glass bed and the light of the scanner. And um, I can kind of dictate maybe what kind of shapes I might get by like how long I or how short I drag my work, but the outcome I will not know until the scanner is done producing the work for me. So um, in this project, it was, it, it was an interactive art piece. So when audience pick, pick up the cubes, disassemble or reassemble and move the cubes around. Their actions introduce shadows or new colors by refracting light to the animation and the nearby spaces. So the audience has the agency to change the visuals of the installation or bring the animation outside of the screen, literally that, uh, that future visitors will experience. So over here, um, there, here's a shadow or a reflection of my animation on, on a perpendicular wall that um, that was kind of introduced to this new space by holding the acrylic cube, like acrylic 
dis, um, disassembled cubes near the projector in a unique way. So the audience of the exhibition engaged with my art in unexpected ways that I wouldn't have thought of as as a maker of these of this project. So this is when a transformative collaborative experience happens. Um, sorry, this is what happens when a like, collaborative experience is invi like, invited and encouraged. Um, oops. Sorry. And then collaboration between multiple artists and institutions as hosts or partners. This is a project between myself, between me and artist Laura K. Keeling. Um, this is this is part of Design TO 2021. It is a diptych of digital collages exchanged between the two artists, reflecting on labor, love, and acts of care that have become especially prominent in our communities during the pandemic. This um, Laura, Kelly, Laura K. Keeling and I exchanged conversations, readings, and our own artworks to learn more about each other's personal narratives that inspire us to make the art that we do. And uh, twice a week for four weeks, uh, Laura and I exchanged two digital collages and each added a new scanned image of plants, textiles, or other everyday objects to develop this diptych. Um, so the reciprocating acts of care through the labor of consciously contributing to each other's work has culminated in a visual representation of what could only be the result of a truly collaborative effort. And this, is, um, this was an installation outside of Harborfront Center in 2021. And then the, uh, the project Layers of Love uh, expanded into further collaboration with more artists and another gallery uh, called the Robert McLaughlin Gallery in Oshawa. So in collaboration with the Robert McL in partnership with Robert McLaughlin Gallery in Oshawa and in collaboration with three additional artists, Kaya Joan, Nicole Kirsten, and Jan Nemirovsky, um, all five artists lent fragments of our existing artworks to this project um, and which the audience were invited to um, layer, reveal or conceal in a collage format. And then how, so, so we were kind of like asking the audience to kind of think about how would the arts meanings shift and generate new meanings and relationships through the agency given to the audience to use um, artists' work in, in a way that's meaningful to them. And recently on that note, I've begun to think about like the labor of the audience. So who like who is uh, engaging with this website, um, the labor of the audience, ownership and authorship. Um, so collaboration between artist and machine. So this was a project from 2021. It is called Buta Lives. Uh, Buta Lives acts as a living documentation of an ongoing process of the changes, distortion, and reinterpretation of the Kashmiri floral motif, now known as paisley over centuries of colonization, believed to have initiated in the seventh century, the Buta motif uh, continues to live today in many forms and functions. The flowering plant motif is asymmetrical, shaped like a teardrop with its corners curved. Sometimes it stands alone and sometimes it is embellished with smaller uh, Buti or uh, Buti, which is plural for Buta, or other flowers inside, um, inside and around it. So over here, um, and then the Buta motif has represented flowers, flowers in a vase, a mango, an almond, or um, other or peacocks or other designs, inspired by my own woven shawl uh, bought gifted to me from Pakistan. I translated the Buta pattern into a hand drawing or digital hand drawing, and then a small tapestry weaving. So this is a tapestry weaving um, using acrylic yarn, acrylic yeah. So after making the tapestry weaving, I manually broke down the code of the placement of the yarn by assigning letters to the different colors of the yarn. And this code alone took hours to decipher. Um, 
and weaving and coding have a lot of like shared history together. So it's also kind of playing on that note. Oops. So this is the original code. So you can kind of see that like over here, there's a lot, there's no yarn here in the center. So we're seeing a lot of zero, zero, zeros. Um, and then I put the code into an open source website to shuffle the code, to shuffle each letter around um, in each row. So, and, and then the website, I, I input line by line. Um, sorry, I put, I input lines of code one at a, one line at a time, and then the website kind of shuffled um, the placement of the word so that I would you know the yellow the yellow yarn would go somewhere else than it was supposed that I originally intended it to, and then based on the new code I rewove the output line by line to create a dis distorted image of the original Buta tapestry in which the motif becomes illegible. So I was speaking to how um, through centuries of colonization and um, capitalism and kind of, you know, transformation of the motif. Um, sorry, yeah, the motif has become transformed in a way that it's a very generic motif now and people don't know where it, where it comes from. So I, so it was a collaboration between me and the website to talk about that. Collaboration between artists and community. Um, this was a project uh, hosted by Arts Etobicoke, which is a not-for-profit arts organization and a creative hub in Etobicoke, Toronto. Arts Etobicoke provided mentorship and training to six BIPOC artists to learn augmented reality, art techniques to transform a location in Etobicoke into a site of significance. I chose, um, my site of significance was by, a, was by Lake Ontario. It was at uh, Mimico Waterfront Park because my family spent a lot of time um, in, by, like, we spent a lot of time by lakes and by water bodies when we first migrated to Canada and when we're, when we're getting to know um, our new home. So this, my, my project was called There's Food From Home and um, the experience of bringing delicious but cold home cooked meal is not uncommon for many newcomer and immigrant families. Food from home is often um, one of the only things immigrant families hold on to, preserving recipes and knowledge handed down from previous generations. The shared hunger for food from home be, uh, brings newcomers together by connecting communities, creating friendships and strengthening relationships that last beyond the food plate. So there's food from home is an augmented reality experience that transforms the viewers into their own um, family picnic memories created through the photo, uh, sorry, created through the photogrammetry of my mom's cooked food and open source models. This picnic experience rep, um, represents memories of my childhood family gatherings in parks. And so to create this piece, I I asked, it was also like an unexpected collaboration between my mom and I for the first time in terms of art practice. So I asked my mom to cook biryani um, the way she always does and the burgers. And I took like hundreds, like 850 photos of just this pot of biryani to transform it into a, um, a 3D model that Albedo Informatics um, were they turned they transformed the models into an augmented reality piece and around the picnic um experience there were five handwritten recipes generously shared by residents of arts sorry, re residents of etobicoke um the recipes were floating around space in the ar project and these are family heritage recipes and stories that demonstrate their relationship with food and family one of the community residents who shared a recipe showed up to um, a tour, a public tour of the augmented reality project. So of course I invited her to share the space with me and talk about her project, sorry, her recipe and what it means for the family. Um, and I also, so this community part, um, how it happened was it was a one hour Zoom conversation between me, the community residents and a staff, um, a storyteller, um, staff from Arsitopico. And so we had we just had a casual conversation about food and their family heritage food, um, heritage food. And I invited them to um we invited them to cook food and look for their families and share a recipe 
and um, they were provided funding to purchase the groceries or the ingredients required for, to make the food. So it was, the, they were remunerated. So this recipe is um, handwritten by uh, Rayash Raya Ben. Oops. This, uh, reci this recipe, Jana Masala, is handwritten by Kamal Dillon. This recipe, um, tuna and kidney bean salad, is handwritten by Myrna Chasin. Only when we were talking about this recipe, it was such a delicious conversation that I ended up making the salad right after, and I ate tuna salad for a week because of our conversation and the recipe. And this handwritten recipe for panset bihun is uh, by Rika Casaneda. And thank you for listening and watching. And thank you for thank you, Jasmine um, and Toronto Real Asian International Film Festival for inviting me and making space for uh, this conversation and Karina for putting so much care into moderating this event. And I'm looking forward to hearing the other artists. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Khadija. Um, Casey, would you like to your presentation next? Okay, um, so I'm going to do a fast track basically throughout my arts career. So I'm going to bring you right back to um, my second year of my Bachelor of Fine Arts in Kamloops, BC. Um, this was uh, the second uh, work that I made using earth materials um, and the first work that I made bring those earth materials inside of an architectural space to kind of disrupt the architectural norm. Um, so this piece is called uh, assemblage, audio assemblage Kamloops, and it's a response to my time in Kamloops um, with an experimental kind of um, approach to it. So um, these are a bunch of found objects, earth materials and found pieces of, of wood, some manufactured, like there's a bed post here and two by fours, that sort of thing. Um, and there's a bunch of uh, microphones that are housed within uh, the work as well um, that are feeding into inputs uh, behind this large piece of wood here. So going into a, um, a delay pedal, a distortion pedal, and then fed back out into these kind of fractured uh, headphone sort of pieces. So it's it was somewhat of my first interactive piece where people can go up to the microphones or the work would would take in the sounds from the gallery and basically like emit it back to them. Um, it was also one of my first large scale works. So you can see this weird guy here um, shows you kind of just how big it is. It's 14 feet by 14 feet. Um, and my inspiration for my works come from a plethora of different places. Um, so if anyone's familiar with the band name Tool, um, this is kind of like uh, an interpretation of their Anima uh, cover, which is like kind of a TV full of eyeballs. That's It's a holographic color and that sort of thing. So I want to make something that kind of looked like that. Um, then moving on into my fourth year work for my, my um, bachelor's degree, uh, this piece is called a mode of ascension. Um, and it's a eight foot uh, log um, that's hollowed out about three quarters of the way um, from the top um, and houses a big uh, PA speaker inside. Um, a lot of these uh, pieces of, of branches and, and wood have been harvested from all over Kamloops. Um, and it's a response to kind of the harmony and the chaos of the universe. Um, the audio soundtrack was a bunch of found sounds and experimental sounds um, brought together to kind of uh, create both harmonious and chaotic um, uh, soundscapes in order for the, the viewers to sort of be immersed in many different ways. Um, and just gives you an idea of how it was kind of set up. Um, it was also a response to environmentalism in a way and some of the um, ecological sort of disruptances that can happen uh, because the, in in southern BC that year there was a pine beetle infestation. So within my first year of, of uh, my degree, 
it was a beautiful campus. There were tons of trees around. And then when I came back for my second and third year, about half of the trees were cut down on campus because of the, the pine beetle infestation. So these trees needed to be cut down. Otherwise, they would just fall over because the pine beetle was eating it from the inside out. Um, so it was an opportunity to work with very large materials. Um, this shows, I think I was about like a few weeks into the hollowing out process. Uh, so using a giant, a giant industrial uh, drill with a big drill bit, um, a reciprocator saw and a crowbar. Um, and by the end of this hollowing out process, I basically had to tape up my wrists like a boxer so that I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, break my wrists or, or sprain them or anything like that. Um, after my BFA, I took about six years off and just worked. Um, and one of the events that really launched uh, my career was the Insurgents Resurgence exhibit at the Winnipeg Art Gallery in 2017. Um, and I was commissioned to do a uh, an on-site installation. So for this work, I um, went out with just some gloves and a piece of rope that I tied together and looped around and harvested uh, wood, uh, driftwood from the Assiniboine and the Red Rivers. Uh, and this piece is called Gone But Not Forgotten. And it's a uh, response to the, the people that have been found within uh, the river systems of Manitoba. Um, so it was a very emotional, uh, emotionally challenging um, process to do this installation, but I feel it was something that needed to, um, you know, I needed to raise awareness about this, this, uh, this issue and the situation that's happening within Canada that the government seems to be like trying to sweep under the rug. Um, so we was uh, featured on on CBC Indigenous. I did uh, an interview for that. I think it's still floating around on on YouTube. Um, so you can hear me talking about it a bit more. Uh, this shows the kind of scale of the work in an exhausted Casey after I was completed. Um, and it was an amazing show, and I can't uh, speak highly enough of it and the other artists within the space. Um, and then after moving to Winnipeg uh, to pursue my MFA, um, I was invited by uh, Video Pool and the Send and Receive Festival to do an on-site installation uh, within their poolside gallery. Um, this was within the, the thick of the pandemic in, in October 2020. Um, and this piece is called Sadze Time. And it was created as a reflection on how um, the aspect of time has moved very differently for a lot of different people throughout the pandemic like time has flown by but at the same time it's really stretched and elongated um so i wanted to speak to that as well as how people perceive time differently um and how animals certain animals perceive time differently like how cats and sparrows um, people believe that they kind of interpret time a lot slower in, able, in order for them to navigate their environment uh, with elegance and grace. Um, and for this work, there is a, a 360 uh, LIDAR scanner that's housed within the, the trunk of this piece there that takes in the viewer's proximity to the work, um, which then affects the audio soundscape of of the installation itself um the theme for the festival was voice so i created the soundscape for this installation primarily with my voice octaving it up and down um and depending on your variance to the installation there can be some sweet spots uh, that you discover um, and it cycles through um, images of experimental color and uh, interpretations of the sun and the moon um, and when people are in the space, they can look through the installation um, over the shoulders of their friends or, or other people and kind of reflect on the time that, have, that has been spent with those people as well. Uh, moving into my MFA work, um, this is the uh, work in process when I was in the thick of hollowing out these logs. Um, there was a uh, quite a few um, willow, large willow trees that were cut down on campus uh, for whatever reason, I'm not quite sure, but I decided to upcycle those materials in order to kind of give back um, to the university in a way because a lot of, uh, you know, students and faculty members within the university really missed those 
those trees they, they were very beautiful but they had to be cut down so i wanted to kind of pay homage to those materials as well um so this just gives an idea of some of the tools that were used to hollow out these logs uh, one being an electrical chainsaw um which was nerve-wracking to say the least um plunging a chainsaw into a hollow log i had to be very careful um you know sort of gives an idea of the the process uh, for how to do this and uh, it got to a point where the logs were naturally breaking and cracking as they were drying out so i decided to break them naturally um with um uh, like wood wedges and a sledgehammer um, so that when I was going to put them back together that they would be seamless basically and it was it was going to be a lot easier to kind of like hide the the split sort of situation it also made it really easy in order to hollow out the logs uh, with the chainsaw as well um, so that gives an idea of the scale of the largest log. Um, so it was kind of a reiteration or the second version of my BFA installation. Um, so rather than using one eight foot log, I was using uh, five logs, the biggest one being five feet, the second biggest being four feet, and the third bit biggest being three feet. Um, so it was quite a process. And uh, within within this process as well, I decided to do a 3D mock-up of, of the concept of the installation um, using Blender and some highly detailed textures in order to kind of push the realism of the installation. Um, and this is the first time that I did a 3D mock-up of an installation, and it really helped me to kind of envision the space and to take things into con consideration that maybe normally I wouldn't um, if I didn't do this. So it gave me an idea of like composition, um, the use of space, uh, the use of uh, projections and that sort of thing. Um, so this is the finished work uh, that was housed at Urban, Sham Urban Shaman uh, Contemporary, Contemporary uh, Art Gallery in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, I had to do it at a satellite location in Winnipeg because the main gallery at the University of Manitoba uh, the way it was constructed, the ceiling isn't able to support heavy materials, so I had to find an off offshoot location. Um, so these are just some stills of the work itself. And you can see within um, at the base of each of these logs, there's a 3D LiDAR scanner again. So instead of just using one scanner for the Sedze time installation, I was using five scanners for this installation. And each log had a custom uh, soundscape amended to it, um, which was driven by Max MSP, which is a visual kind of programming language. Um, and what it did was that uh, even though there are five different soundscapes, they're all linked together at, on the same time code so that they're all working in unison with each other. And because this was still within the pandemic, um, a lot of, of ceremony, uh, drum dances, powwows weren't able to take place. So I wanted to create a space that can give the viewer that sort of sense of ceremony, um, albeit in a different way, um, with uh, you know technology and uh, and light and sound that sort of thing. Um, this is a work uh, that I created um, within the construction of of my MFA work, um, where throughout the hollowing out process, uh, one day I was just looking at the logs and I was like, wow, like those that kind of looks like water or waves. So I took um, quite a few pictures of the insides of the logs and added this this uh, kind of like loopable motion um, into it and kind of just I posted it because it was just I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, and then a curator in Vancouver for Access Gallery saw this as they were curating a show called Waves. Um, so that kind of got me into this show um, based primarily on like interest of, of creating this. Um, and then a, um, I was invited out to uh, Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island to create an on-site uh, experimental um, installation, dig digital installation. So this allowed me to kind of work a lot with uh, particle emitters and um, sort of ambient effects within Blender to create this this uh, this installation that I named uh, Nahitla, uh, which means light. 
um, and corresponds to just the the changing of space and perception um, and uh, projecting onto surfaces that normally wouldn't necessarily be used, uh, such as the underside of the staircase there. Um, and moving on to uh, a bit of performance. Um, this is a piece that I created. Uh, it's wearable technology. Um, the work is called The Balance. Um, and what this is, is uh, three pieces of caribou antler uh, that have eighth inch uh, audio cables going inside of them. Um, and on the back side, there's contact microphones. So this, I call it like an audio choker. Um, so basically you wear this and the bass um, contact mic sits on my Adam's apple and then the mids and treble are on each side. Um, and then those kind of like drone uh, frequencies were fed into Max MSP that, that also triggered uh, some audio and video samples. Um, so this kind of gives an idea of what it looks like when it's being worn. <laughs> and um, so this was performed for the first time in Victoria, BC um, last spring, I believe. And um, I'm kind of like re revisiting this work uh, in the near future in order to um, showcase it again at some point. Um, and then slowly moving into the digital aspect of things, um, this was kind of an experimental um, piece that I made in Blender using LiDAR scans of trees uh, throughout my neighborhood, and then intermingling some of the um, shapes and movement uh, created within Blender. Um, this was kind of pitched as an augmented reality work. Um, <clears throat> I had the uh, opportunity to work on a, a video game uh, with Alex Dalt, um, uh, based out of Vancouver, BC, um, and we, we created this work, um, and it was called, this video game called Mosher Island, which is an actual island um, uh, just off of the shores of Yellowknife, uh, North Coast Territories, and the concept for this game um, basically followed the the teachings of the medicine wheel where you explored this this island that had four different quadrants and within each quadrant you were to find um sage sweetgrass uh cedar and tobacco which are like the four uh offerings um in indigenous teachings um so it was it was kind of like a, a searching game it was also kind of like a survival sort of game because there's different um there's different landscapes and different seasons that you kind of go through such follows the medicine wheel um with a fire um in the in the middle of the of the island as well and within each quadrant there's there's fires that are kind of like checkpoints because you had to keep your your stick of fire your torch going throughout uh and then when it ran out um we didn't say this but basically you'd freeze to death so uh it was kind of um it was like a a, a school project for alex as well but i was able to um, provide the concept for it as well as the narration and uh, the music um, for the for the video game as well. So each of the four quadrants had a different soundscape and when all of the soundscapes were brought into the middle, they again all worked in unison to create this like unified um, sort of like composition. Um, moving into more like primarily 3D uh, works. Uh, this is a piece that I created called uh, Caribou 3020 which um, kind of envisioned how through a thousand years of genetic mutation and uh, evolutionary processes that um, caribou would kind of change and they'd adapt to their surroundings. So their antlers are intertwined with each other and they're housing these like energy orbs and the caribou themselves have kind of changed into somewhat of an alien species. Um, so if you look closely, this caribou has six legs as opposed to four, uh, enable, in order for it to navigate its, its, um, surroundings and landscape a lot easier. Um, and I just thought glowing hooves looked cool, uh, with hair particles on it. So I amended that as well. Um, and this actually turned into an augmented reality work that was shown in Vancouver, uh, BC. Um, and uh, this is a piece uh, that I created called Future Sweetgrass, um, which enabled, uh, or which is like a interpretation of what sweet, sweetgrass would be in the future. Um, so you have the natural strains, you have these glowing sort of strains, which are, which are used for like healing and planting. 
um, as well as these kind of transparent um, sort of strands that house nutrients, which is um, uh, used to ingest. You know, it's it's basically all the nutrients from the earth that you can you can eat and uh, for health and that sort of thing. So these are some uh, fly through videos that I created for the work as well. Um, into more some of my recent work, um, I'm really inspired by traditional materials. Um, so this is a work that I created called uh, beadwork, um, and the inspiration for this work came from a beaded. Um, uh, card holder that I was gifted after doing a, a, a music sort of uh, workshop for the for the community of Bechico. Um, and then using that as, as a texture for this figure that's walking through this space and and beads are kind of like um, flying all around it. And there's like some collision physics that are amended to this work as well. Um, this is a work that I created uh, called Ancestors. Um, and it's inspired by like tanned hide, uh, even though the, the hide within the work doesn't have the consistency of tanned hide, it's a little, a little tougher and doesn't move as freely. Um, but I just wanted to create something that represented um, like the different side of our ancestors, like within indigeneity, whenever you talk about ancestors or, or that sort of thing, it can kind of be sugar coated somehow, whereas everything's beautiful, everything's nice and that sort of thing. But I want to make something that, that represented like our badass ancestors, like um, the, and I want to create something that was a bit haunting and, and sort of like dooming, but also beautiful at the same time. Um, and this is a, one of my most recent pieces. I just posted this like last week or the week before. Um, um, and it's a, it's called breaking away, um, which is basically a figure um, that's floating within the forest um, and its its body is kind of fracturing and, and exploding and, and giving back to nature. Um, so the inspiration for this piece actually came from a song uh, from a band called Ratatat uh, based out of Brooklyn, New York. Um, and it's my all time favorite song from from the group itself. Um, so that title um, I think about a lot of things whenever I, I hear the song, it's even though it's just an instrumental sort of piece, but um, the the concept of this is is like you're you're giving yourself up to to nature, you're releasing all of the inner stresses that society puts on you and and um, kind of just like relinquishing that and allowing yourself to to be free to break away from all of the stresses of of life itself. Um, so I believe that's it for my presentation. Um, thank you, Masi Cho. Uh, this is my website, Instagram and Facebook. If you choose to follow my work, I um, I post a lot of works in progress sometimes, and um, because I like to see other people's works in progress, I I post that as well just to see how things are made, that kind of thing. So thank you. Thanks, Casey. Uh, last but not least, Morishin will be presenting now. Oops, can you all hear me okay? Perfect. Okay, so I am going to only talk about um, two body of works and I'm going to focus on um, both collaboration as well as um, issues of access uh, in relationship to some of my research. And um, these are specifically works that I have uh, been focused on for the last um, five years and uh, you know it's always challenging giving 10-15 minutes presentations um, but I'm going to do my best to fit it in. Um, so I want to start from a body of work uh, called Moon Faced that um, I started working on since six months ago um, the idea of moon faced and the word actually moon faced um, comes from this uh, long history of um, ways that the, the 
the ways of looking at um, these like ideas of beauty around gender, as well as the perception of gender um, historically had been very queer and non-binary in Iran. The word moon-faced, which the Farsi um, translation for, it's translated from Farsi, which is mahtalat, for example, uh, was a word that in older literature in Iran would get used as a way to define the beauty of both men and women. So, um, you know, if you are a man at that point and you have a thin waist, or if you're a woman who has, you know, mustaches or like really thick um, unibrows, um, you get to, you know, perhaps be called moon faced. Um, so this is going back specifically to a dynasty which is 350 years ago um, called Qajar art, uh, where when you look at the history of also visual art and painting, you see a similar uh, kind of repetition as what I explained with the word uh, moon face, which at a time would get used to define both the beauty of men and women, but through time, at a contemporary time in Iran, only it gets used to define the beauty of women. Uh, within these old um, painting portraits, which are very famous during Qajar dynasty, uh, you see this notion of queerness of presentation of these figures. So in the picture that you see here, you can't really say if they're two women, if they're two men, if it's one woman or one man. Um, these are some images from women who are some of the favorite women of the king at a time, who, as I said, uh, it was considered to be more beautiful if you had mustache. Women, if they didn't have enough mustache, sometimes it would draw more. So kind of like showing how our understanding are obviously like perceptions of beauty has always changed through time. So what happens with Qajar dynasty is that, um, you know, at the beginning of 19th century, all these very like non-binary queer presentations of these figures are very popular within visual culture. As you get closer and closer to the end of 19th century, you see a shift that happens in these paintings, uh, which a lot of these portraits then start to become more and more, um, more and more queer, uh, sorry, more and more actually gendered. So from non-binary to more and more gendered. Um, in a project that I worked on, I kind of wanted to use this collaboration with an AI system, which um, th the specific libraries that I use are VQGAN plus CLIP um, to kind of undo this, this history, which the reason, some of the reasons behind uh, these visual kind of paintings and in general the visual culture of Iran becoming more gendered is for example the entrance of uh, camera technology to Iran uh, or Iranian painters influence as westernization in Iran starts to happen modernization of Iran start to happen the Iranian painters start to become more influenced by um, European painters in which the portrait paintings are much more gendered so you know if there's a portrait of a woman uh, it's you know, you know, it's a woman. If it's a man, you know, it's man. It's a man, and the camera technology also like adds this more kind of idea of realistic um, paintings or kind of uh, you know using the images or pictures as a way to mix it with the the Western aesthetic. And with my collaboration with this AI system, I try to undo or repair this history of Westernization of these images. So I use, uh, I've, I've used an archive of many, many of these paintings that in them you can see, the images you see right now are more like images that are like these, these figures are gendered. You know, you can say, this is a woman, this, this is a couple that are a man or a woman. And the collaboration with the AI system basically requires a series of phrases that you kind of have to kind of work with the AI, this AI library, understand how it's to different words and different phrases. Um, and through that, creating a set of videos and imagery um, that again is much more queer. So as you like watch a video, you can't really tell again if it could be a man or a woman. Uh, and those ideas of gender become much more um, non-binary. So it's just like a short, it actually has a sound, but I don't think it's playing right now, but it's okay. You can watch it. I'm 
And that's two more. And a lot of my work, um, you know, uh, for the last perhaps like 10 years has been about uh, creating this uh, nonlinear, non-binary relationship between uh, technology and history. So not thinking about, you know, history as something that only belongs to the past or not think about technology as this, you know, element that belongs to the future, uh, but a much more complex relationship between, between the two. Okay, I'm gonna pass to the next body of work. Oh, this is also uh, my installation of this work. This was um, at um, Oasis Foundation in Athens, an installation that was like outside, which I have, I mean, this is a video installation of the piece, but I have added this like dome-like kind of um, representation of it with mirrors around it which is how a lot of these traditional paintings were framed. So when you look at them historically, they were framed in like dome frames. And I kind of like have added this mirror element where it adds the space around it. And also the audience member as they stand with it can create, you know, different perhaps relationships to the work. Okay, the second body of work that I wanna talk about is She Who's the Unknown. It's a project that I worked on from the, uh, beginnings of 2017 until 2021. So it's a long-term research-based project. It has many components uh, from installation to sculpture, to new stories and video work, to public events, to reading room and uh, performances that I've done. So again, uh, due to this, uh, this presentation today is supposed to be like short, I'm not going to go in depth to all, all the aspects of it, but I will present some of the uh, figures and like some of the general ideas around it but feel free to spend time on this website I try to make my websites very also accessible so that you know as if you haven't seen the work or like if you want to read more about it if you want to like have access to the research or the archive all of that is is possible um, so she who sees the unknown is a body of work and that looks at the figures uh, that are monstrous um, or, uh, you know, gen slash, you know, the English word for it, genie figures um, within uh, mythical stories in the Middle East and North Africa that are female or, again, in some ways, genderless, non-binary. The reason I became interested originally in this project um, was because kind of I was looking for these like forgotten mythical stories that are usually not talked about. So growing up, you know, in Iran, we have a lot of mythical stories, but then usually the main characters are always male. And I was interested in ways that um, I could bring in, you know, the stories that have not really been talked about that are about powerful female figures. And so this took a lot of research. I have looked through many, many manuscripts, spent hours and hours. Like this is kind of where my, my work as an artist becomes blended with being a historian, becomes blended with being an, almost an archeologist. And this is something that also gets repeated in many of my work in general. Um, so there are five general figures, Puma, Yajuj, Majuj, Aisha, Kandisha, the Laughing Snake, and Kabus. And there is a process that I call refiguring or refiguration, uh, thinking about through refiguring the past, how can we refigure alternative uh, presents and alternative futures. Um, for those of you who might not know, Jen uh, are in Islamic context are uh, these creatures uh, or spirits that are said that they look like smokeless fire and they can be both human and non-human so they're very hybrid in a way there are also culturally a lot of stories about jinn um in you know are in a lot of like arab persian uh, stories that you grow up with knowing that jinn are always around knowing that they exist perhaps the western i guess equalization of that is is the, the the figure of the ghost you know um and they are represented in many manuscripts and books um again as these like hybrid human monster human animal um spirits um one of the reason i was really interested in the figure of the monstrous uh was because kind of the potential i saw in the figure of the jinn something that at a time when i was starting this research which was again 2017 
there was not really that much work that had been done on the figure of a jinn as a figure that had the potential for thinking about you know borderline figure this thing that um rosie bray Dotti, for example calls the relationship between human non-human western non-western way of um thinking about uh you know figures and also i was interested in monstrosity i was interested in uh perhaps horror fiction etc uh, because of for example, what I think um, the Out of the Woods Collective does a great job of uh, kind of talking about, which is that we need to engage with dystopian fiction that extrapolates from the white, able-bodied, colonial, heteropatriarchy that structure our world. So through uh, um, you know, embracing this monstrosity, turning around different uh, structures. So I look at these stories, I, I choose these figures, and then I write new stories about them. And then through these new writing, I connect these stories to different issues from uh, you know, climate crisis to um, patriarchy to um, personal stories around kind of like love and sexual desire, et cetera, all relating to the, again, the Middle East. Um, I'm just gonna show you very quickly three of the figures. This is Homa. As you can see the image on the left, at least my left, um, is from a manuscript called Kitab al Bulhan, which is a manuscript that goes back to 1400 years ago. Um, and she is known, Homa, the word Homa in Arabic means uh, fever, and is known as a figure or gen that brings fever to human body, heat and fever to human body. So I kind of connect her story to heat and the heating of the planet and, the, and kind of uh, uh, talking or thinking or like reimagining what justice around conversation of climate crisis could look like. This is a 3D printed sculpture of her. I create this installation for each of these works where you know I think about each of the figures as a figure that has its own shrine. So as an audience member, you enter in place this space and then can build different relationships which each of um, each of the stories and figures. This is, for example, another figure, Aisha Kandisha. She's a Moroccan jinn known as this very um, powerful and erotic gen that um, brings um, basically, well, uh, if if you're possessed by her, and this happens mostly to men, uh, you have to participate with her to not go insane. And when you're possessed by her, it is said that she creates a crack on your chest and that opens up, you know, an incoming traffic zone of other gen and spirits. And um, for you to kind of not get get into this space of basically jonun or insanity, you have to listen to her and work with her. So this is an installation where I'm, I've created this kind of blood pool. Also, she's known as a, as a spirit that comes out of um, the rivers. And I'm connecting her stories to stories of love, revenge, and healing. Again, feel free to check out the videos because these, these, each of these have like videos or a VR piece or like a web-based work. There's two other um, figures that I'm not going to talk about today, the laughing snake and yeah, Juj Majuj, and um, you can have access to all the information about them. The last figure is Kabus, um, the right witness and the left witness, which again, um, their story is one of the, the ones that get repeated in different cultures but within the Islamic culture, the word kabus means nightmare. So it's a spirit that, you know, you can see how it's illustrated in these manuscripts. But when she sits on your chest, it creates uh, sleep paralysis. Maybe some of you have experienced sleep paralysis. It's a, it's a very scary feeling because you're in a nightmare, but at the same time, your body is numb, your brain is still functioning, and you enter a place where you kind of also see yourself from outside. And I'm not going to get into all the scientific research I did around why it happens and how it's related to trauma. But in this body of work, I'm connecting this idea of nightmare um, and sleep paralysis to stories of four generations of women. Um, and I've developed it as a VR film, as a commission for a space in New York called The Shed. Um, and so the four generations are my grandmother, my mother, myself, and an imagined daughter. And it's about war and, you know, Iran-Iraq war and uh, this relationship between war and childbirth. And kind of through this tell retelling of these stories, um, you know, my mom is involved in this project where she's reading from her diary when she's pregnant with my sister, etc. 
and she's talking about feeling guilty or not not being sure if she should give birth to a child during a war but then um, my kind of proposal is that the only way to break through this intergenerational trauma um, is um, to give birth to something non-human which is my daughter is a monstrous human figure that then tells a story of the future and the installation is a bedroom audience member walks in and they put a headset there's sculptures of two other figures that are the right witness and the left witness as you can see in the manuscripts Kabus is always accompanied by two other figures so I renamed them as right witness and left witness and uh, yeah you get to see her only when you put the headset on Okay, and the final part is the archive of this body of work. As I said, this, this project took five years. The research aspect of it was really important. Really the work I was doing was to go and find and dig deep into a lot of manuscripts, some that were not available to scan some material for the first time, but at the same time to deal with a lot of gatekeeping of Western institutions that owned a lot of these manuscripts. And um, through that kind of like really obviously kind of getting to practice every day this idea of what this colonialism historical colonialism really mean when they have access to our cultures and histories and manuscripts but at the same time for example one time to get access to a manuscript they wanted me to like sign a contract in one of these institutions that said that I won't put it on if I put it online I will um, I will have to credit them etc or other ways of like only having access to some images um, or only black and white content. So uh, it's kind of this um, concept of digital colonialism. This is a term that I also developed since 2000, end of 2015. I've given many, many separate one hour lectures about it, which, which you know, so I'm going to like really summarize it here. So this is my um, uh, definition of colonialism, which is a framework for critically examining the tendency for information technologies to be deployed in ways that reduce colonial power relations. Um, this is a work that I did separately with another project called Material Speculation ISIS, which I'm not going to talk about today. Maybe during a QA it will come up. But kind of thinking about again this notion of digital colonialism, I thought about this idea of sharing this archive. So is open source always good? So what would it mean for me to put this whole body of work online? Um, to give not, I mean, the, the archival aspect of it, all these manuscripts that I had gathered and to give access to this material. You know, when we think about, again, these troubles with knowledge and giving access to knowledge, how can we share knowledge while we protect knowledge? Um, so for me, I, I developed a whole archive. I collaborated with a historian in Iran where we, for the first time, we sat and detailed kind of listing of the manuscript material and you know from the kind of a paper to the kind of like font that was used um that was not not done prior to that and the thing with the archive is that this is the archive so when you go on it everyone can have access to the first layer of the archive it's categorized in four layers and you can see this is farsi this is arabic this is english and this is how you can download it and also these are the image galleries um, but when you click on head of this figure, it asks you to put in a series of codes that you can only put in if you know Farsi or Arabic. And for me, these were like what I call basically, you know, these cultural codes and language codes that goes back to this idea of experimenting. Again, is open source always good? Experimenting with this idea of um, what does it mean to give access to knowledge while you protect it? And then how can we play around with, with these concepts? People throw these words of decolonizing obviously around a lot. It's been a very trendy word, especially in the last like five, six years. But for me, it's been really important to kind of think about what does it mean to actually practically practice these ways of decolonizing, right? What are the models that we can create that, that we can learn from each other about practical practices of decolonizing, in this case, an archive and a series of manuscripts. And as you put the code in and the, the deeper you go, um, the, the material that are in, in these like layers become more and more unique, become more and more rare. And for me, kind of this categorization was important in terms of 
um, knowing who was the demographic that I wanted to give access to this archive to hopefully build with, to hopefully build from, and these acts of collective sharing um, in a community that um, you know mattered to me uh, for this project. All right, I'm gonna stop here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Marcin, and thank you, uh, Khadija and Casey, for sharing so much about your practices and. Yeah, I've got uh, just a couple, a few questions to ask each of you um, before we open it up to the audience. Um, so the first question I have is for Khadija. Um, you presented a lot um, of your collaborative projects today and I was wondering if you could share with us about what is the most valuable thing for you about collaboration. Um, I think the most valuable thing about collaboration with any buddy or anything like a machine is agency um so like both um, individuals or both parties having agency in kind of determining the outcome whether that's like inclusive conversations about like what both what everybody wants the outcome to look like or kind of trusting each other um so for example with my collaboration with laura um with the diptych project the layers of labor of love so it's kind of so it was about trusting each other that um, after I work on this layer um, this this layer of collage uh, Laura would um, kind of in exchange put care into responding to my layer um, and I would do the same so I would respond to Laura's la uh, Laura's layer of the collage um, with care kind of like you know highlighting certain things that I know um, she likes or, and then kind of like in my own voice or using my own uh, visual voice. So um, yeah, I think having, or giving every, every like party agency. Thanks Khadija. Um, Casey, we, I think somebody had this same question um, in the audience, but yeah, your practice is very interdisciplinary. Um, and you've explored and combined a lot of different tools in your creation process. Um, and you did mention using Blender in your presentation, but are there other softwares that you enjoy using in your practice? And also, do you have any advice uh, for newer artists on how to navigate like the plethora of digital tools that are available today, um, especially since technology develops so rapidly? Right. Um, so from a digital sense, um, some of the other tools that I use a lot. Um, so for 3D modeling, um, I do most of my my modeling in VR uh, using um, software called Gravity Sketch, which uh, enables a lot of control of, of control points and vertices and that sort of thing. And you're able to uh, produce models a lot quicker, I find, uh, than with with a mouse. Um, on a two-dimensional screen, you're able to implement depth um, a lot easier and, and quicker. Um, and the workflow from that to Blender um, is really uh, is really nice and, and it works really well. Um, in addition to the Adobe Creative Suite, um, you know, to bring videos together, you know, Adobe Premiere, that sort of thing, um, as well as um, using LiDAR scanners, um, like from the newer iPhone series, they have uh, LiDAR scanners that are amended into their, their phones, so you can like 3D scan um, basically anything with a variation of detail. Um, in regards to uh, uh, advice for um, for people getting into digital art, there's there's so much now, um, and, and what works for some people may not work for another. Um, so I'm a big fan of of taking risks. Um, I actually credit that to you know my career. Um, maybe some things wouldn't have happened if I didn't take these risks and and take a chance on specific tools or initiatives or opportunities even. Um, so I really just um, would advise people to give things a try. You know, you never know what you're going to be good at unless you actually try it or what's really going to work for you or what you could pick up um, really quickly. Um, and then, you know, within that, you'll be able to find like, you know, your kind of style, right? Like, even though my practice is very interdisciplinary, it's very all over the place with variation of mediums. I'd like to think that, you know, I have a certain style with my work and, and people 
you can kind of like notice this like a piece that's made by me. Um, so really just jump in and and you know try uh, especially with with digital digital art and and programs and that sort of thing. There's always an undo function, you know that's always something that's there so. Um, you know, if you try and do something, you go, oh, that didn't work, control Z, you know, undo. Um, so that makes it that makes it a lot easier for for the digital arts realm and how people are able to produce something really engaging so quickly. Um, those those digital tools have enabled us to get our ideas out there in a very rapid way. So it's easier to hollow out a tree. Uh digitally than it is in person absolutely <laughs> <laughs> thank you that's really good advice actually taking risks um uh my next question is for Morishin and um so yes she who sees so known as this ongoing series that you've been adding to for for many years and I that I've personally admired um for a while as well this like multi-dimensional um almost like really living archival practice and, and um, I was wondering if, if there's anything have, that has changed for you um, in terms of how you approach this ongoing series from when you first began it and 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 now. Um, yeah, um, I mean, it's the the project is done now. I and mean, I finished the last component of it in 2021, which was the archive. Um, but I just did a commission for, um, I was asked to do a commission actually just recently for Denmark Museum of Art um, to make like a new figure, um, which kind of as a ritual sculpture uh, project that, that comes with also like events, et cetera. So, you know, I feel like it's one of those things that I'm like, no guys, seriously, I'm done. Like stop asking me to do stuff for this project. And then I, it, I'm just, you know, I'm like, okay, no, seriously, this is the last one. Um, but, you know, I've, I, as I said, like, actually right now I'm working on a like film project in Egypt, but I would say through the course of like the five years that I worked on it, um, I mean, I think for me, it kind of was really important to um, find comfort in thinking about all the different ways that this project needs to be represented and can be represented. I'm not talking about only the visual component of it, which means that it, you know, it's an installation that goes in the gallery. But in general, my work and the extension of my work has always been about how you can go outside of the, you know, white walls of a gallery or museum. And what does that mean in practice? So as the project developed, I started to do events with it. I kind of, it was important for me to think about um, always kind of having a reading room with uh, the exhibitions of it because I wanted the ongoing research that was kind of continuing. This was before I released the archive um, to kind of become part of the way that people would come and experience the work. Um, so, you know, um, one thing that I always talk about is um, that I wish art was not taught in art schools with such like quick turn turnout and deadline, you know, a small assignment thing only like that. Um, education of art, like taught kind of having to stay with the work and going deep into it. And this obviously very capitalist pressure of like, oh, constantly put out a work and like, just, just, just put things out, you know, but really what it means to take time with a project or like really think about research, or think about ways that you can, again, um, come to a project in a way that you really build a deep relationship to it. Um, and for me, that's something whenever I teach workshops, whenever I'm you know, teaching at universities, that's something that I try to really encourage younger people to think about or do is to sometimes force yourself to stay with something and like really go deep with it. Um, and again, cause I feel like we're all in this place where the art market constantly wants you to create new things um so what does it mean to go a little bit against that when when possible thank you i think that yeah sure thank you for sharing that that's it's really valuable to i guess reject the hyper productivity of of artists within capitalism between slowing down and taking risks I think those are 
two really good advice. Um, we're a little bit on tight on time, and I do have more questions, but I'd like to uh, ask the audience first if they have any questions that um, they'd like to ask the artists. Um, if not, I can also continue asking questions. Okay, um, but if you do have any questions like um, that you want to uh, ask that comes up, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll definitely prioritize uh, the audience question. Um, okay, I have another question for Khadija. Um, so we kind of briefly talked about this when we were um, speaking before um, just a few days ago, but uh, yeah, in your experience, what are some strategies that you've seen in uh, galleries and museums that you feel were um, successful in engaging the audience or specifically unlikely um, like museum visitors and or are there any strategies that you'd like to see or like you'd like to see, you, you wish you'd see more in in museum spaces? Um, yeah, I think, well, I think that museums and galleries attract audiences. Um, like the attract who they're showing. So um, if they're showing, like, if they're showing all um, white artists, their audience will be mostly white. So I think kind of museums and galleries showing diverse artists will bring in um, these artists networks of friends, family, and other peers um, who will benefit from like kind of entering into a space that is not always welcoming. Um, in my, I know that like every or a lot of museums and big galleries have community initiatives where um, they, they might have a small community gallery or um, a space for workshops. So that's that's a way that um, a lot of museums and galleries invite unlikely visitors. But I think my favorite experience, um, kind of, I guess, appreciating the museum like, the museum's effort was uh, when there was a community exhibition um by the textile museum of canada and um the food the food at the, for the reception included samosas and it included the you know the typical cheese and grapes but it also included samosas and other um and other uh snacks and appetizers from from other cultures and i was taken aback by surprise like a, a happy surprise because i think just like having um food that everybody like other folks can recognize um i don't know it just kind of says like you are welcome here please have a samosa um so i think of food is a is a strategy but also i think language um i remember once i took my grandma and my mom to the textile museum to give them a tour of the of one of their exhibitions and i was translating the work like I got I myself got a tour and I was translating um it would just mean my mom and my grandma and I was translating it in Urdu and I was like you know um engaging with my grandma especially in that way and I think that was a very meaningful uh strategy because my grandma wouldn't kind of go to museums and galleries on her own or for any like reason other than like to come to see my work. So um, especially not in Can Canada. So I think um, I wish that museums and galleries kind of, um, I guess, spent some time and labor if they had the like, capacity to um, connect with community organizations in their cities or vicinities and connect with community organizations that serve different um, audiences, speaking different language and kind of facilitate tours of their, of their institutionalized space um, in, in other languages than just um, English and French. Um, do we have time for a couple more questions, Jasmine? Okay. Oh, now I think Nawang has a question. Hey, um, uh, my question is, I guess everyone, anyone can answer, but I was mostly thinking um, about Mauritian's work. Um, I'm thinking about like the space, spaces like museum archival collections that, uh, you know, uphold, uphold standards of cultural preservation um, and even pr presentation. Um, and I think about this containment of cultural objects um, in these spaces as a 
as a form of extraction itself. And you spoke a bit about this already, I think, but um, I'm just wondering if you uh, have more to say about how this um, kind of denied access or you know, the levels of bureaucracy and obstacles that you have to deal with to even access or retrieve materials that you, you are concerning to work with for your project um, informs both the administrative aspect of your work as well as the conceptual and like the creative aspects of your work, if that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Thanks. That's a great question. And it has that question, you know, has like many different like components. I think um, for me, you know, I mean, this is kind of the stuff that I talked about and the work that I did as a response to some of these restrictions as ways of understanding, you know, different notions of colonialism, access to knowledge, et cetera, really started like unfolding and kind of like becoming more and more relevant due to the the kind of work that I was making you know like archiving for example for me had always been for again you know the last perhaps eight nine years uh, a thing that I was very interested in as an artist like how to document and archive different elements using different technologies you know not just on a website but like even thinking about a process like 3d printing as archival work right so um it's 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 like when your work, I think, is also like research based, then the process becomes very important. It's not just a product, but like really thinking about what does that process mean in terms of then the final destination or the labor you have to put in as an artist, the kind of things you have to deal with. So, as you said, when you when we think about colonialism of, of like, let's say, objects, when you walk into the Met or you know um, the British Museum or whatever like we all also like understand this notion of historical colonialism of objects and I feel like especially the last like maybe like five six years these um, institutions there has been more and more cri critical kind of push and thinking toward like their practice so they've tried to kind of now become more transparent or like return some stuff but when you think about again this notion of what I you know what I discussed digital colonialism like digital ownership there's a still so much like gray area in a way that there's a way to kind of like argue that oh no this is not like it's it's you know open source or like this this knowledge belongs to like everyone etc so for me um this other body of work I also did which involved process of 3d scanning and 3d printing 3d scanning specifically which was this new a newer kind of process and technology that was becoming common, especially in the 2015, 2016 boom of that technology was very important as an artist. I was using these technologies to also understand how else it was being used, right? I think that's our power as artists who use technological tools is to how to learn, how to interrupt them, how to use them, how to misuse them, how to, um, you know, kind of unlearn the process of using them. So if someone has made a 3D scanner and the way they use it, mostly a lot of these tech companies is to go to like, for example, cultural sites and historical sites of other countries. And they now have ownership of these digital data, the digital scan of other countries. Then for me as an artist, it was really important to then build a whole body of work around digital colonialism. If you're interested, there is um, a performance lecture I did called Physical Tactics for Digital Colonialism, where I dig more, much, much deeper into this issue. Um, but it's how these, all these, these ways of dealing with, um, uh, you know, uh, troubles of technological access, technological um, domination, etc., then feeds back into the way that I make my work. So constant reflection, constant, like even going back and correcting sometimes myself or my own practice as an artist. And to me, that's the most important part of grow growth as an artist is to um, never feel comfort in one place and always try to push the boundaries, even if it's your own boundary. Thanks for the question, Alan. Um, how are we doing, Jasmine? Can I ask another question or? Oh, one more question? Okay, then I guess I'll, I, I'd like to open up for um, all three artists then. Um, I just wanted to ask like, what are you currently excited about? Um, and is there anything that you're currently working on that you'd like to share with us? 
Anyone can go first. I'll go. Um, <clears throat> so I'm um, currently working on a few different projects. Um, one is a augmented reality work um, that's a partnership basically between Canada and the United States, but primarily within um, the Denny Nation and um, the city of Dallas, Texas, um, which um, kind of draws a lot of uh, inspiration and support from the local indigenous tribes from down there. Um, and with the idea of migration of animals and people from uh, the Americas uh, throughout North America. Um, as well as uh, a, um, a, a film that uh, some producers in the Yukon Territory of Canada are creating, uh, which is half live action and half uh, 3D animation. Um, and I was hired as like the lead uh, for the animation within that to assemble a team to create a half an hour of 3D animated content for these six uh, storytellers um that are that are basically telling their story of their interactions with the woods and uh the forest and that sort of thing um as well as some virtual tours of the winnipeg art gallery that deal with the architecture of the space and as well as the indigenous names um, that are housed throughout uh the gallery um there's numerous other projects uh that i'm juggling right now but those are the the few that i'm excited on that are going to keep me um busy over the rest of the winter thanks casey uh Maureen, you mentioned you were working on a film is there anything you'd like to share or anything else you're excited about in general um yes so i'm working on a speculative documentary feature length project and I've been developing it. I mean, the conceptual aspects of it, the research aspect of it for two years. I've never made a, like a long film. So it's really hard, don't do it. <laughs> it's, coming from a visual artist to a you know film industry, it's such a different process. So I've been like learning so much about, you know, like pitch writing, grants and it's a whole other world like to to kind of get involved and also it's a very different level of collaboration so right now I'm in Egypt as I mentioned earlier and I am we just worked on a production of it and the one line log line is that I'm looking at um the history of technological innovations and um scientific tools that were invented during Islamic golden era, which then, you know, uh, served as an anchor point of the development of many sciences in the West. And there's five chapters in the film and each person, as, uh, so there's either a scientist or a future teller or a historian that is engaging with a specific tech, uh, scientific tool as a way to reimagine the future of the Middle East and North Africa. So. Sounds very exciting and also stressful. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, before we wrap up, Khadija, is there anything you'd like to share on um, what you're working on? I'm excited about my final MFA exhibition uh, that's scheduled for mid-March in Montreal. And, um, and I'm also excited for another project that I'm going to be working on. I'm not sure I'm allowed to like talk much about it right now, but it involves um, working with archives and kind of reimagining archives uh, for the future. And that will be next, like in January. Very cool. Um, yeah, very excited to see what all three of you uh, are going to put out. Um, yeah, thanks so much for, for sharing uh, today. Thanks so much for having us and thanks to everyone who participated. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, just a reminder that there's one more panel at 4 p.m. I believe that's also free that you um, are welcome to attend if you have time. But otherwise, you know, thank you again to our three artists, to Karina and also to our captioner for being part of today's panel. And if you have any follow-up questions or inquiries, you can email them to me. I'll drop my email here um, and I will try to get that information to you from from the art. So have a good day, stay safe.
and uh, see you soon. Thanks, Jasmine.